Well hello again everybody and welcome to TAT, or as I like to call it, this and that. It's actually been quite a while since we did one of these TAT videos where you watch me unbox stuff and the reason for that is because my wife said that if she caught me bringing any more rubbish into the house she was going to kill me but luckily she's away this week so she isn't going to catch me is she? Hey, happy days! Now I don't think it matters really what order we look at these in but I think we will start with the, uh, the biggest one first just so we can clear up some desk space. And it is quite a big one. So this large package here, I actually bought it on eBay and uh, I actually bought it to use on one of the previous little videos that we made but unfortunately it didn't quite arrive on time. So uh, it's actually just been hiding at work, waiting for an opportunity for me to uh, sneak it into the house. So on first inspection the, uh, the seller spared no expense in packing materials did he? Because he's just used the old common old garden uh, newspaper. But having said that, it does look fairly well wrapped. Oh, something in there. Let's hope it's not a dead hamster. Oh, we've got a plug. That's quite a nice spot. He's actually wrapped the plug up so the prongs don't go through the side of the box. So we've got a mains lead here. On the end of the mains cable, we've actually got one of those. I think they call them a figure of eight connector, don't they? Because they kind of make up a little figure of eight shape. Now I seem to remember that back in the day they used to use things like this on uh, things like old tape recorders and maybe electric razors and things like that. But that's not really going to give you much of a clue for what we've got here, is it? So let's put that on one side. Well, you know what? I think we can make a rubbish game out of this. So. Uh, Let's see who's first to guess what this is. So we're just going to tear a bit of the packaging open. Let's start at the bottom here. Ah, so it looks like we may have uh, some kind of a handle here. Oh, bit of a clue there, but it shouldn't give the goods away right away, should we? Hmm, telescope in action. God, it's taking me longer to unwrap than a girl from Barnsley, this. Serial number FB6360762. Come on, you little peas. Oh, maybe some big clues coming up there. So whatever this thing is, it's actually got a maker's badge on the back and it says National. Now I'm not sure, is National the same company as National Panasonic? I think it might be, but it actually says, I think that's Matt Shushita under it, Matt Shushita. The problem with these massive Japanese companies is they are absolutely massive, aren't they? And they kind of absorb a lot of famous brands. So I'm not sure if National is a parent company. I don't know what the relationship, but I always thought that National was Panasonic, but I could be wrong. I'm sure you guys know better than me. Now I can also see we've got a model number here, but if I see or hear anybody getting their mobile phones out and Googling this, you're barred. So just put those away. The model number is TR. 505 GB and apparently whatever this thing is it will operate from 240 volts at 50 Hertz or DC 12 volts 6 watts mm. and we've got a warning label how splendid caution to prevent electric shock do not remove cover no user serviceable parts inside refer servicing to qualified service personnel well that rules me out doesn't it but what I think they're actually trying to tell me is uh, take this cover off and have a look inside don't forget, the moment you guess what this is, leave it in the comments. I want to know when you guess. Oh, and it comes with a nice little uh, battery condom. Oh, two battery condoms. Oh, three battery condoms. Not only would my wife have to sell her kidneys to pay for the batteries for this thing, I think we'd probably have to go for a liver as well. Hmm. How many batteries does this thing take? Gosh, well it looks like this thing takes 9D cells. I'm not actually sure that there is 9D cells in the world. Did they ever make such a number? Got no idea. Yep, can't see us ever putting any batteries in there. We've got some more sockets on the back. So we've got a 300 ohm connection here, so we've got two Two screws actually where you can uh, you can install something. I'm not going to tell you what you install here. So we can, we can put 300 ohms in there. 
or we've got a switch here, we've got another connector and this looks like we can switch between either 300 ohms or 75 ohms. So what could possibly have a 300 ohm or a 75 ohm input? So it looks like we've got a little drawer on the side and that says earphone pocket on it. Oh it's a little flap, oh we like flaps don't we? Perhaps this thing won't work unless we put an earphone socket inside so uh, as luck would have it here's one I prepared earlier so uh, yep yeah, that should work. We've got a nice knob here and we've got ooh, a power switch, a nice clunky power switch, that's nice. So we've got a volume control, contrast, brightness and we've got another, ooh, Commando, Commando 505, so uh, yeah, Commando, we really don't need to say anything about that do we? Um, hmm. Right, okay, well I think I've teased you enough haven't I, so it's time to put you out of your misery. So what we've got here is a very small portable black and white television that will run from either 12 volts or 240 volts mains AC. Now according to the front of this it has a model number which is the Commando 5 and 5 and as we said earlier it's made by National. So there was a couple of reasons why I bought this and probably one of the most important reasons is because the wife said if you bring any more junk into the house she was going to kill me and uh, this is actually small enough that we can hide it somewhere so that's a real plus. But the other reason is because I actually think this looks like a piece of test gear. To me it actually reminds me of uh, something like an oscilloscope or something like that. Some people have said it's got a military look to it and I suppose it has got this commando name down at the bottom so yeah maybe uh, maybe kind of a military link I prefer to call it maybe a tactical that's what they call it today tactical generally if you describe something as tactical it just means you charge three times the price and paint it black doesn't it so uh, that's what we've got here we've got a tactical black and white television oh we've got noise Well, not unsurprisingly, we're not really picking anything up, are we? And there's a good reason for that, which is because they actually switched off analog television broadcasting some years ago in the UK. So, unfortunately, we're never going to receive anything, are we? Well, if only we had a TV pattern generator. And luckily we do. <laughs> so let me just insert this into its bottom. What have we got our switch set to? 75 ohms, which is right. Uh, I think we want the UHF output on here. We want to have the 625 selected and uh, let's switch on. And I guess all I can really do now is, uh, well, have a tune round. Are we going to get anything? I think we had something there, didn't we? Okay, we've got some uh, controls on the back to do with hold, haven't we? Do you think they'll do anything? Oh, there she blows. So I can see looking through my camera that we've got some horizontal bands which are sweeping upwards on my television screen. Well, they're just artefacts on the actual camera system. It's probably something to do with uh, the frame refresh rate and the actual speed that the, uh, the camera takes its pictures. It's not actually real. The picture's actually very, very stable. But actually looking at the picture, one thing I can see is that we've got this grid pattern, and this is what I've got selected on the pattern generator. But the, uh, the grid pattern isn't entirely linear. It looks like the, we've got quite re deep rectangles at the top. And then we kind of have squares. And, uh, well, it's distorted. It, these, these squares aren't equally spaced. The mesh isn't got, it hasn't got an equal spacing. So I'm guessing that's some form of uh, non-linearity in the television setup. I'm, uh, I'm not exactly sure. So it does actually give me a better opportunity to test our pattern generator because I haven't been able to really give it a good go. So we've got this vertical width control, let's try that. Oh, so it looks like these bars are getting wider. I'll turn that back down again. We've got an RF tuning control, so yeah, just lets the tune in the signal. Got a stabilise control. Seems to have the effect of 
shifting or centering our video image, our checkerboard. And we've got some different patterns. So let's try, well the, the dots worked previously, didn't they? So here's some dots. And again, you can see here that the dot pattern, you can see those dots are actually quite widely spaced. And then at the bottom, they're quite narrow. So I'm sure to a television person, that will actually mean something. That's probably some form of distortion. It could, of course, just be that this pattern generator, this has actually been asleep probably for the last 20 or 30 years. And there was an awful lot of adjustment points inside this pattern generator. So it could also be that this pattern generator is out of alignment. The television could be fine. Oh, this could be the pattern generator. I'm not sure. So there's the dots. There's the cross hatch. Now the next one should be a grey scale. Now that didn't seem to work when I last tried that. Okay, I can actually see a grey scale there. Not particularly good. Ooh, it seems like these pots are a bit noisy, they need some switch cleaner. Yeah, we've adjusted the contrast control we can kind of get a grey scale to appear. So what you can see we've got kind of the screen at this side is light and uh, the screen at this side is uh, dark. Actually looking at it on the camera you can actually see a better image than I can at the moment. It's really not that obvious that we've got this grey scale on here but the camera seems to be pulling it out better. And then we've just got kind of a blank raster pattern. That's not very interesting is it? Let's go back to our checkerboard. So I would say that this uh, this television is working, isn't it? You know, I actually feel quite nostalgic looking at this little black and white television. Well, you know, seeing a black and white television again makes me feel all nostalgic. And I can remember late at night lying in bed, all safe and warm, waiting for the mucky Channel 4 film to come on. Oh, happy days. <laughs> Well here's the next item that we're going to look at and uh, there's a bit of giveaway here because it's actually got a label on it that tells us what it is which is a, a sound level meter. Now I actually bought this at a recent radio rally and uh, the reason that I bought it is because I had £10 and uh, yeah that's basically it. So for those of you playing along at home, this was actually manufactured by Sirius Research Limited, made in England. And uh, it does have kind of that quality feel about it. It feels like a nice piece of kit. And it looks like, uh, just reading the label on it, that there was obviously some tie-up with the Open University here in the UK. So on the front of it we've got a range switch. So it's got 30, 50, 60, 70, 80 or 90. I'm assuming that that is uh, DBs. We've got an off button and some settings that say off DBA and DBC. And then we've got some modes here where we've got, it looks like LEQ, SPL and SEL, cell. Don't know what any of that means, got no idea, don't know anything about sound meters. I just thought it was an interesting piece of equipment. So let me try and turn it on. And I guess if I start talking, the needle will go up, which it does. So it looks like on the 30 dB range, just me talking actually makes the needle peg to one side. So let's try the 50 range. Is that any better? Is the needle still pegging? Well, just talking in my room, it looks like the needle's going up to about 20. Now the chap who sold this to me said that this has kind of a few interesting ranges. He says you could also kind of use this as a, a dose meter where it would actually monitor your exposure over a period of time. So uh, I'm not sure how you do that. I'm just going to press some buttons and see if it will go into that averaging function. So one, two, three. Is that averaging? No, it doesn't seem to be averaging. The uh, needle is going back to zero all the time. Let's try the, let's try one of the other settings. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so when we have it in the SEL, it seems to be holding. It's kind of doing a peak hold function. Well, it's not peak holding. Every time I speak and it absorbs a bit more sound, the needle goes over a little bit more. Let me try putting it onto a higher range. It's got a reset button. 
one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you can see as I continue to count, it's actually monitoring the total sound exposure and the needle is just going to probably keep increasing and increasing. So it's some kind of, uh, I guess, some kind of summing amplifier. Again, not exactly sure, but it seems to do that. So I guess this averaging function is if you're working in, say, a noisy factory environment, you're not just interested in the peak noise you're exposed to, you're actually interested in the total amount that you're exposed to over the working day, because the effect, uh, I think, of loud noise is hearing damage, it's cumulative. So it's not just the peak sound level that causes damage into your ear it's actually just how long you're exposed to it so obviously this will do this uh, this this averaging function as well so you can see that as i speak to you the needle just bounces up and down in response to my voice i don't know what it is but there's actually something very therapeutic about watching that needle go up and down now it could actually be that it's pleasing because not only do i like the sound of my own voice i can now actually see it so we've got another label on the battery compartment. It says to be used only in accordance with the instructions provided by the Open University. And maybe for those of you playing along at home who want to find out a little bit more about this equipment, as I said earlier, it's made by the Sirius Research Limited Company. It's made in England and we've got, I think we've got a model number there. It looks like it's CRL 2.22. So 2 decimal 22. Now I suspect this piece of equipment is quite old so it's probably not available but maybe you can find them second hand as I did this one. Okay well I've just given it a saucer of milk and we better just check it switched off because I'm going to put it away in its box and uh, we'll see this little fella sometime in the spring. Well, I have to say, I'm actually quite excited about this next item because I actually imported this. I bought this on eBay and I bought it from Germany and uh, it took a little bit of time to arrive and uh, it's been something that I've actually been keeping my eye out and I've wanted for quite a long time. So as I said, I'm genuinely, really, I'm quite excited about this one. So let's see what's going on in the world. Oh! Well, it seems to be one of them days where everybody's decided to wrap stuff up in a newspaper. So what we've got here is a little signal injector and uh, what you would use this for is for tracing out maybe radio circuits or amplifier circuits. So you'd use this in conjunction with a signal tracer which is basically just a big audio amplifier. So what you can do is you can inject a signal into one part of your circuit and then you can sniff for that signal to see if it actually gets there using a signal tracer or, or maybe even just listen to it on the speakers of the amplifier or something like that. Now back in the day they were quite a common piece of equipment to have in the uh, workshop but certainly I've never owned one before, not a portable one like this. So I'm actually quite excited to have it. So it looks like the model number is an SE 250C. I'm not sure who manufactures it. We'll have to have a look at the uh, at the instructions. And according to the instructions, this was actually manufactured by the Sansei Electronics Corporation and it was made in Japan. The signal injector SE 250C is a rugged, handy pocket side oscillator at 700 to 1 kilohertz with harmonics up to 30 megahertz. So what we're going to have here, we're going to have a, a square wave and that square wave is going to be perhaps 1 kilohertz but the thing about the square wave which is interesting, it's going to have very very sharp, it's going to have a very fast rise time and that's what makes it have all these harmonics because uh, if you do the math, I think if you, I think it's a Fourier series, isn't it? You do something like that. You can actually prove that a square wave actually contains every frequency under the sun. So if you can actually generate a square wave with a very fast rising edge, it contains lots of other frequencies that can be picked up. So it says it's got harmonics up to 30 megahertz. It's got a simple push button operation, 
output of 1.4 volts peak to peak. Now that voltage output is quite interesting so I'm guessing that this has been designed for transistor radios because there is different versions of these around on the market. Now some of these actually had kind of a little coil inside which was almost like a little flyback oscillator and they could actually pump out quite a high voltage. They were designed to work with valve equipment but this one with its 1.4 volt output this is clearly designed to fault find on things like transistor radios. So we've got an output of 1.4 volts peak to peak at an impedance of 10 kilo ohm. It has a one touch battery replacement ideal for quick and easy troubleshooting on all types of radios, amplifier, tape equipment and TVs. And it says that it's supplied with a pen light dry cell and instruction manual. Well, I'm not sure if this is the uh, instruction manual. Does that class as an instruction manual? So specification frequency range 700 to 1 kilohertz with harmonics up to 30 megahertz. Signal output 1.4 volts peak to peak. Output waveform is square. The impedance is 10 kilo. DC input is DC input voltage, that seems strange. 50 volt max. Oh, I'm guessing that's saying that as long as you don't use it on circuits with that are more than 50 volts, you're not going to blow the thing up. So that again, fine for transistor radios because you're not like to find voltages in excess of 50 volts. The power supply is a pen light -like drying cell, one piece. Dimensions and weight, approximately 21 millimeters in diameter, 159 millimeters long, and it weighs approximately 50 grams. How to insert dry cell batteries. So we've got to bend down the head against the case so that the slit comes into the top as illustrated right. Then the head comes off easily from the case. Now amazingly we were just looking at that national television and now we've got a national high top battery and it does look like a kind of a really shitty Chinese battery. So uh, yes, no. Well, it does actually say 1.5 volts, but um, no, I'm not going to trust it. I'm sorry, I'm just not. That's a no. So what I think we're going to install instead of that horrible Chinese battery is uh, some of these extortionately expensive lithium energizer batteries. Now, I always say whenever I buy test equipment, I always put lithium batteries in it because even good so-called batteries, main brand ones, and uh, especially Duracells in my experience, they leak. And personally, having spent money on test equipment, I don't really want to have that piece of test equipment destroyed for the lack of putting a good battery in it. And I've said many times before, I've never had a, a lithium battery leak on me. So I do think for test equipment, it's worth paying the extra. Okay, so we've got that in. So, I guess in theory, that should do something now, shouldn't it? Oops, God, I couldn't get that off and now it doesn't want to stay on. There we go. And of course, I think it'd actually be quite interesting just to have a look at the output from this signal injector on our oscilloscope. So let's just do that. Now, the main thing about one of these is you want a square wave that's got a relatively fast rise time. So just putting some measurement functions on our square wave, it looks like we've got a peak to peak of about 1.69 volts and our frequency is 807 hertz. So relatively low, not even a kilohertz. But the thing about it, it's not actually the frequency, it's actually the rise time of the edge. Now to me that doesn't look particularly fast by modern standards, so let's have a look. So we've got a rise time of approximately 25-26 microseconds and we've got a fall time around 93 nanoseconds. So the actual fall is a, you know, it's a little bit quicker than the rise, isn't it? Well, quite a bit quicker for that matter. So I'm guessing it's actually the fall off here that's maybe generating all the harmonics. Well, that's just given me an idea. I wonder if we'll actually be able to see some of the RF harmonic content on this spectrum analyzer. Let's have a look. So I've just gone ahead and I'm connecting my spectrum analyzer to the output of the signal tracer probe and I'm using a fairly low value of DC blocking capacitor because the last thing we want to do is put any DC into the front end of our spectrum analyzer because that'll really ruin your day. Now at the moment you can actually see quite a lot of noise bobbing up and down on here and uh, well amazingly enough that's just the noise that's in my room. It's actually pretty much alive with RF from, well I'm not far from some transmitters and um, my room is quite noisy, I've got a Wi-Fi router in here, I've got LED lighting, so yeah, it's quite interesting to see how noisy it is. But if I actually turn the signal tracer on, you should actually see it jump up a bit. 
you can see that the overall noise level does actually jump up and as the manufacturers have claimed there is actually a relatively high level here of uh, harmonic contents and uh, it seems to extend well above the 30 megahertz which they claim. Now I did say earlier that we'd use our signal injector along with a signal tracer but you wouldn't necessarily need a, an audio signal trace because I've got a radio here and I've got it turned on and the problem might be that you've just got no audio output and you're not sure whether it's a problem with the amplifier or maybe it's something wrong with the previous RF stage or something like that. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, connect this up. I'm going to connect this to the actual zero volts line on the radio and now I've just got to find somewhere to, uh, to basically to prod around at. So I haven't got a circuit diagram for this so I'm just going to uh, go ahead and uh, let's choose the top of that resistor and see if anything happens. So basically I had to press the button down so I touch it against the resistor. Let's try, can we get onto the antenna? I don't think there's any antenna connections particularly visible there. We could go onto the variable tuning capacitor So just to give you a really kind of forced example, I've just gone ahead and I've pulled out my recently purchased Heathkit signal tracer and you saw me restoring this a few weeks ago and I've got this so it, it basically is just an audio amplifier with a, a probe that you can touch into a circuit. So if I touch the end of this, I'll turn the volume up a bit, so you get some mains hum, that's just me coupling mains into this, but what you can do now you can't hear anything coming from this radio at the moment. The reason you can't hear anything is simply because I've got the uh, the volume turned right, turn right down. But for example, you could actually have an audio problem. You could have a duff audio output transformer, or you could have uh, maybe just a broken speaker. I don't know. But we can probe brown with the signal tracer, and although the radio isn't giving any audio out at the moment, if you choose the right point, so I'm going to guess there. Seven on tall sport with Nagros, bed with and we should be able to tune around with that. He said, can I find the tuning knob? So using the signal tracer you can basically probe round looking for audio. You can also use this probe actually, it's got an RF setting in which case it will actually demodulate any RF that it picks up into an audio waveform. So that's you know that's generally a use for a signal tracer. I can't really um, give you a lot of examples how to use them because I've got to admit I have owned signal tracers in the past but I've just never used them so uh, these are new to me but if you want to know more about um, signal tracers you should probably watch somebody like the Radio Cruncher Graham because he uses signal tracers all the time and he can give you some really good examples where me, I'm, I'm, I'm a novice in the world of signal tracers but they can be very very useful for working on radio equipment. There you could see we were using this and we can pick up some audio from our radio even when the amplifier isn't working. So what I can actually do is I can inject some audio into this radio and if all the components are working correctly between the output of our injector and the uh, input to our signal tracer probe we should get some audio, we should be able to hear it. So I can just demonstrate that if I actually just make the connection directly. So I'm going to inject a signal now at the far end of the circuit, somewhere near the antenna. Now that really isn't much of a proof, but you can imagine we might have one of these inductors, one of these IF coils, it could be totally open circuit, in which case the injected signal wouldn't actually be able to go through it so I would actually be injecting a signal but we wouldn't hear anything on the tracer because the transformer was open circuit so that's the kind of use that you can put these things to. Now actually inside these as I said earlier there is a couple of different designs 
but the most common one is actually just a very very simple multi vibrator circuit and funnily enough we were looking at multi vibrators last time inside that pattern generator it was actually using a valve based multi vibrator circuit to generate a square wave which was used to modulate the output of the pattern generator but this is much simpler than that this is just a couple of transistors and a couple of transistors and resistors and you can build these incredibly easily I think the hardest part about building one of these is actually just finding you know a suitable container to actually put it in um, to make it look nice and accessible so what I'll do is there's, there's lots and lots of circuits for building these on the web so in the show notes I will I'll put a link so that if you want to build one of these for yourself and have a go um, you'll be able to do that as I say they're very easy to build it would probably take you no more than half an hour to build one the hardest part is putting it in a case so the next item that I have to look at today is perhaps a little bit random because it's actually a two-way signal booster. So this is the kind of thing that you actually have if you've got multiple televisions in your house and maybe a weak signal. You can actually use this to actually amplify the signal and, uh, well, supply lots of televisions in your house without degrading the signal. Now the reason that I actually bought this is because you know that I've got an interest in uh, vintage televisions and I've got something called a standard converter which converts a 625 signal into the uh, 405 line television signal that I need for my vintage televisions and a few people have said that because these uh, standard converters are relatively expensive it's probably a good idea to put some device between the actual standard converter and your vintage television so that if you do get something squirting out the back of your television some nasty high voltage it doesn't destroy your standard converter so a few people have just um, recommended video amplifiers now I thought that was one particular use for it but the other reason that I bought it is just because I just thought it would be useful to have a wide band amplifier in the world workshop because we could probably use this for taking measurements with a spectrum analyzer and stuff like that amplifying weak signals oh it actually comes with a plug i didn't realize that i thought this was something that you had to actually wire up so here's a unit kind of passes the squeeze test it feels actually really quite nice and tough got a mains flex on it which is permanently wired in Let's just undo that. The plug comes fitted with these little plastic condoms because we don't want them breeding, do we? Now I'm hoping that there might be a little bit of a specification in here. I'm kind of looking for a frequency range. So according to our instructions here, this thing's got a bandwidth between 87 and 782 megahertz. So that's fairly wide, isn't it? It's got a maximum gain of 20 dBs and it's minus 15 dB adjustable. And it's got a maximum output of 95 dB microvolts. Well, I'm sure that you're all going to be glad that I'm not actually going to spend a great deal of time looking at this. But I did think that what I could do is uh, we can actually plug it into the spectrum analyzer and uh, actually just do a frequency sweep over it and just see what it looks like and maybe also see if it matches the uh, the amplification the gain factors that the manufacturers actually say it does now unfortunately I can't actually test this up to uh, 700 megahertz because this old spectrum analyzer that I'm using here it only goes up to about 400 I have got ones that uh, go up to a higher frequency but uh, 700 is enough for what I'm doing so that's what I'm going to test it at so it looks like here's the input which is the antenna input to the piece of equipment and then it's got two output sockets here which it just says TV1 and TV2. Now one important thing about this is that this will be, because it's television and video, it's, uh, it's going to be a 75 ohm device rather than the 50 ohm that my test equipment normally is. So we're going to have to just do some adapting for that just to switch between 75 to 50 ohm. So just looking at the front of the unit, it's got the manufacturer's name, which is SLX. It's a two-way signal booster. Looks like we've got a power-on indicator here, some kind of LED. We've got this red compliant sticker, so they're obviously very, very pleased about the fact it's red compliant, whatever that is. Um, we've got the uh, gain adjustment pot there that you can adjust with a screwdriver. We've got the antenna, which is actually going to be the input to the unit. And then on the uh, other end of the unit here, we've got two sockets, which are TV1 and TV2. So they're going to be the outputs that are amplified. So just looking at the back side of the unit, again, it's manufactured by SLX. It's red compliant. Again, they really are very proud of this red compliance. And uh, it says we've got a variable gain from 1 to 16 dB. Noise figure minus 3 dB an impedance of 75 ohm it's 220 to 240 volts it's 50 hertz 5 watts and as far as our frequency there we go frequency 87 to 782 megahertz 
Well, it looks like our amplifier actually draws so little power that it won't even show up on my uh, little watt meter here. Nope, everything's reading all zeros. So I'm just going to do a quick check to make sure there's no evil DC or AC coming out of this, because there certainly shouldn't be. Okay, so there's no DC. And let's just check for any unwanted AC. Oh, it's actually showing a little bit of something. Showing 109 millivolts AC. I wonder if that's right. Oh, and a bit more on the output sockets. 503 and again 500. Well, as you can see, I've gone ahead and I've fired up my Spectrum Analyzer, which is a Marconi. 2382 and uh, the frequency range of the spectrum analyzer it doesn't go particularly high because it is old school it goes from 100 hertz to 400 megahertz but i do quite like using it and that's why we're using it today well you can see i've got the input to the spectrum analyzer here that uh, goes via this box so what this box is it's a converter it goes between 75 ohms to 50 ohms and it's got an attenuation factor of about 9.61 db now the reason that you need that, uh, that in place is because most RF equipment, or certainly a lot of the test equipment I've got, it's relatively modern, so it has 50 ohm input impedance, whereas television and video equipment typically uses 75 ohms. So this is what this does, it converts between 75 and 50, but there's no such thing as a free lunch, there is an attenuation factor, and again that's 9.61 dB. So then at the end of uh, this lead here, we've got our what we call a belling lead connector. And uh, this is where we're going to feed the output from the amplifier into it. So uh, this uh, the spectrum analyzer at the moment, it's waiting to find some, uh, some signal to detect. Uh, and at the moment, it's just showing me what the noise floor is at the moment, which is actually looking, it's about, I don't know, it's minus 95 dBm in here. So this is our signal booster and what we're going to do is I'm actually going to plug in a connector into the antenna connection. So we've got a piece of coax here and on the end of the coax we've got a 75 ohm resistor. So the reason I've chosen 75 ohm is because again video systems and stuff like that typically they will have a, a 75 ohm impedance. So that's why we've, uh, we've terminated it in its complementary impedance which is uh, 75 ohms. And uh, the reason I've done that is because, again, I don't want any RF energy which is just jumping around in my room. I don't want it to find its way in, into this antenna socket. Because what I want to do is I want to kind of measure the noise floor of this booster and see even with no signal, when we just connect the spectrum analyzer up, I just want to say how much internal noise the circuitry generates and outputs because, you know, you don't want, uh, you don't want a device generating noise and affecting your signal do you so this is quite an important test it's usually a good idea before you actually connect your spectrum analyzer to uh, a piece of equipment switch that piece of equipment on so uh, what you don't want to do is connect your spectrum analyzer and be switching this thing on and off because what can happen is you can get um, you can get mains transients that can come through and they can go down into your spectrum analyzer and they can damage the front end so what i would always say is switch the device on first then plug your spectrum analyzer in afterwards and of course that's actually after checking that there isn't any dc output on here so any noise that's being generated by the internal circuitry it's going to squirt out of this tv2 connector it's going to go down our coax it's going to get converted from 75 to 50 ohms and then it's getting squirted into the Marconi there. And I can actually just see there that, well, or rather I can't see that, I would expect if this thing was to generate lots of horrible RF noise, the line on the spectrum analyzer would rise when I actually plug this connector in. And uh, it isn't rising. In fact, that's actually pretty impressive. So I've got the signal booster unplugged at the moment, let's plug it in. And you can see that the actual noise floor on the spectrum analyzer, it doesn't appear to change. And just to prove that there's no shenanigans going on, what I'm actually going to do is, you know the antenna connector that we had blanked off with a 75 ohm resistor? I'm just going to unplug that now, which I've done, and now I'm just going to touch the antenna connector. And my body is going to act as a little bit of an aerial and it's going to squirt some noise in. So this is just a bit of a sense check that everything's working. And you can see that as soon as I touch the antenna jack here, 
we're getting some noise picked up on the spectrum analyzer. So the amplifier is working and it isn't introducing any additional noise that I can detect. So that's very good, that's a pass. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a frequency sweep on this booster. So we're going to feed in, um, starting off at a very low frequency, and we're going to keep increasing the frequency until we get to 400 megahertz. And the reason we're going up to 400 megahertz is because that's the maximum that this spectrum analyzer can do, because it goes between 100 and 400 megahertz. So that's the frequency sweep that we're going to do. So to do that we need to use what they call a tracking generator, and uh, because the spectrum analyzer in this case it's actually going to squirt some RF out so let's I'm just connect in the tracking generator here and again the tracking generator is also 50 ohms so we've got to convert between 50 ohms and 75 again so that's why we've got our 75 to 50 ohm converter box now when you're doing frequency sweeps there's a little you don't have to do this but there's something which makes it all much easier. You, I'm going to do something called normalising. So what I'm going to do is I'm taking the output from the tracking generator and I'm connecting it directly to the input. And what that normalisation exercise is going to do, it's going to take away any discrepancies in these cables and also it's going to effectively null out these, uh, these attenuators in here. So it's probably easier to show you so I just turn on my tracking generator. So you can see that the line that's being plotted on the spectrum analyzer, it's not dead straight, is it? Uh, it's a little bit wibbly wobbly. Now there's a reason that we haven't got a dead straight line and that's because spectrum analyzers, the actual tracking generators, they're not perfectly calibrated, even though this is actually a very good one, an expensive one, they're not perfect. So as the frequency increases, the actual attenuation of the signal also increases or reduces slightly so that so you get these non these non linearities and part of that is what you're seeing there but the other thing that you're seeing you're kind of seeing some impedance bulges so at different frequencies the connectors will present different impedances because again there's nothing perfect also the coaxes aren't perfect so at some frequencies they'll actually attenuate the signal and at other frequencies they won't because although you actually just think of them as a piece of coax what they actually are is filters and they have their own particular frequency response but that can be problematic and uh, it makes all the testing a little bit more difficult. So what we're going to do is we're going to do another little step which is called normalisation. So what normalisation is, it's kind of a little bit of a bodge. When I press this uh, normalise button, the spectrum analyzer, it's going to do a scan and it's going to work out where all these little bulges are. It's going to, for example, there's a little positive bulge there and it's going to say, well, maybe that's plus five. And then it's, and it's going to remember that and then it's going to say, well, we've got a little minus bulge there minus five so what it's actually going to do it's going to mathematically correct for these bulges and uh, it's going to present a dead flat line so rather than talking about it it's probably easier if I just press the button where's it gone there normalize and now our line has just shot up there and it's dead straight let me just change what they call the reference level so you can see there we've got a dead flat line which is what I wanted well, I'm sorry, but I may not have explained that particularly well. But we've got a dead straight line now on the spectrum analyzer display. And it, what it looks like, it looks like the output is constant for the frequency sweep. The output isn't constant, it's just basically hiding it, it's fudging it in maths. But the thing is, we don't have to then account for those bulges and those impedance mismatches. The spectrum analyzer will automatically do it for us mathematically. So what I'm going to do now is, you can see that we had the input linked to the output of the spectrum analyzer. I'm going to disconnect that link and we're going to put our, um, I'm going to put our signal booster in its place. So the output from the tracking generator is going to go to the input. And then the output from the signal boost is going to go to the input of the of the spectrum analyzer. And I just noticed then when I plugged it in, the line on the screen jumped right up. And you can see now that the line is uh, it's actually above minus 10. So we've actually got a little bit more signal there. So even with this amplifier turned down to its minimum setting, because it's got an adjustment on it, it's actually got some it has actually got some gain. Now you can actually see at the left hand side of the spectrum analyzer the line isn't flat it drops off uh, round about the first graticule can you see the first division it actually falls away to minus 40 so you can see that this amplifier is doing some filtering because um, 
it's not it's not amplifying the signal at that particular region so let's just actually find out what that frequency is I'm just going to put a marker on so basically our little booster amplifier it doesn't provide any amplification to the signal below about 44 megahertz so I guess that's a wanted feature and that's actually quite a sharp filter response isn't it so I'm just going to twist the adjustment pot now and I'm going to increase the gain of this signal booster and hopefully the signal should increase on the spectrum analyzer which it has done unfortunately it's gone off scale a little bit I'm going to have to put a little bit more attenuation in and that's maximum so I would actually say that this little two-way signal booster, just according to my quick and dirty test, it actually seems to be quite good, so I'm recommending it. Yeah.